Chapter Eighteen Miss Ophelia's Experiences and Opinions. Our friend Tom, in his own simple musings, often compared his more fortunate lot in the bondage into which he was cast with that of Joseph in Egypt. And, in fact, as time went on and he developed more and more under the eye of his master, the strength of the parallel increased. St. Clair was indolent and careless of money. Hitherto the providing and marketing had been principally done by Adolf, who was to the full as careless and extravagant as his master, and between them both they had carried on the dispersing process with great alacrity. Accustomed for many years to regard his master's property as his own care, Tom saw with an uneasiness he could scarcely repress the wasteful expenditure of the establishment, and in the quiet indirect way which his class often acquire, would sometimes make his own suggestions. St. Clair at first employed him occasionally, but struck with his soundness of mind and good business capacity, he confided in him more and more till gradually all the marketing and providing for the family were entrusted to him. No, no, Adolph, he said one day, as Adolph was deprecating the passing of power out of his hands. Let Tom alone. You only understand what you want. Tom understands cost and come to, and there may be some end to money by and by if we don't let somebody do that. Trusted to an unlimited extent by a careless master, who handed him a bill without looking at it, and pocketed the change without counting it, Tom had every facility and temptation to dishonesty, and nothing but an impregnable simplicity of nature, strengthened by Christian faith, could have kept him from it. But to that nature, the very unbounded trust reposed in him was bond and seal for the most scrupulous accuracy. With Adolf the case had been different, Thoughtless and self-indulgent and unrestrained by a master who found it easier to indulge than to regulate, he had fallen into an absolute confusion as to meum tuum with regard to himself and his master, which sometimes troubled even St. Clair. His own good sense taught him that such a training of his servants was unjust and dangerous. A sort of chronic remorse went with him everywhere although not strong enough to make any decided change in his course. And this very remorse reacted again into indulgence. He passed lightly over the most serious faults, because he told himself that, if he had done his part, his dependence had not fallen into them. Tom regarded his gay, airy, handsome young master with an odd mixture of fealty, reverence, and fatherly solicitude that he never read the Bible, never went to church, that he jested and made free with any and everything that came in the way of his wit, that he spent his Sunday evenings at the opera or theater, that he went to wine parties and clubs and suppers oftener than was at all expedient, were all things that Tom could see as plainly as anybody, and on which he based a conviction that Masser wasn't a Christian a conviction, however, which he would have been very slow to express to any one else, but on which he founded many prayers, in his own simple fashion, when he was by himself in his little dormitory. Not that Tom had not his own way of speaking his mind occasionally, with something of the tact often observable in his class, as, for example, the very day after the Sabbath we have described, St. Clair was invited out to a convivial party of choice spirits, and was helped home between one and two o'clock at night, in a condition when the physical had decidedly attained the upper hand of the intellectual. Tom and Adolph assisted him to get composed for the night, the latter in high spirits, evidently regarding the matter as a good joke, and laughing heartily at the rusticity of Tom's horror who really was simple enough to lie awake most of the rest of the night, praying for his young master. "'Well, Tom, what are you waiting for?' said St. Clair the next day, as he sat in his library, in dressing-gown and slippers. St. Clair had just been entrusting Tom with some money and various commissions. "'Isn't all right there, Tom?' he added, as Tom still stood waiting. 
"'I'm afraid not, master,' said Tom, with a grave face. St. Clair laid down his paper and set down his coffee cup and looked at Tom. "'Why, Tom, what's the case? You look as solemn as a coffin.' "'I feel very bad, master. I always had thought that master would be good to everybody.' "'Well, Tom, haven't I been? Come now. What do you want? There's something you haven't got, I suppose, and this is the preface. Master always been good to me. I haven't nothing to complain about on that head. But there is one that master isn't good to. Why, Tom, what's got into you? Speak out. What do you mean? Last night, between one and two, I thought so. I studied upon the matter then. Master isn't good to himself. Tom said this with his back to his master and his hand on the doorknob. St. Clair felt his face flush crimson, but he laughed. Oh, that's all, is it? he said gaily. All, said Tom, turning suddenly round and falling on his knees. Oh, my dear young master, I'm afraid it will be loss of all, all, body and soul. The good book says it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. My dear master. Tom's voice choked and the tears ran down his cheeks. You poor silly fool, said St. Clair with tears in his own eyes. Get up, Tom. I'm not worth crying over. But Tom wouldn't rise and looked imploring. Well, I won't go to any more of their cursed nonsense, Tom, said St. Clair. On my honor, I won't. I don't know why I haven't stopped long ago. I've always despised it, and myself for it. So now, Tom, wipe up your eyes and go about your errands. Come, come, he added. No blessings. I'm not so wonderfully good now, he said, as he gently pushed Tom to the door. There, I'll pledge my honor to you, Tom. You don't see me so again, he said. And Tom went off, wiping his eyes with great satisfaction. I'll keep my faith with him, too, said St. Clair as he closed the door. And St. Clair did so, for gross sensualism in any form was not the peculiar temptation of his nature. But all this time who shall detail the tribulations manifold of our friend Miss Ophelia, who had begun the labors of a southern housekeeper? There is all the difference in the world in the servants of southern establishments, according to the character and capacity of the mistresses who have brought them up. South as well as north, there are women who have an extraordinary talent for command and tact in educating. Such are enabled, with apparent ease and without severity, to subject to their will and bring into harmonious and systematic order the various members of their small estate, to regulate their peculiarities, and to balance and compensate the deficiencies of one by the excesses of another, as to produce a harmonious and orderly system. Such a housekeeper was Mrs. Shelby, whom we have already described, and such our readers may remember to have met with. If they are not common at the South, it is because they are not common in the world. They are to be found there as often as anywhere, and when existing, find in that peculiar state of society a brilliant opportunity to exhibit their domestic talent. Such a housekeeper Marie St. Clair was not, nor her mother before her. Indolent and childish, unsystematic and improvident, it was not to be expected that servants trained under her care should not be so likewise and she had very justly described to Miss Ophelia the state of confusion she would find in the family, though she had not ascribed it to the proper cause. The first morning of her regency, Miss Ophelia was up at four o'clock, and having attended to all the adjustments of her own chamber, as she had done ever since she came there, to the great amazement of the chambermaid, she prepared for a vigorous onslaught on the cupboards and closets of the establishment of which she had the keys. The storeroom, the linen presses, the china closet, the kitchen and cellar, that day all went under an awful review. 
hidden things of darkness were brought to light to an extent that alarmed all the principalities and powers of kitchen and chamber and caused many wonderings and murmurings about desayer northern ladies from the domestic cabinet old dinah the head cook and principal of all rule and authority in the kitchen department was filled with wrath as what she considered an invasion of privilege no feudal baron in magna charta times would have more thoroughly resented some incursion of the crown dinah was a character in her own way and it would be injustice to her memory not to give the reader a little idea of her she was a native and essential cook as much as aunt chloe cooking being an indigenous talent of the african race but chloe was a trained and methodical one who moved in an orderly domestic harness while dinah was a self-taught genius and like geniuses in general was positive opinionated and erratic to the last degree like a certain class of modern philosophers dinah perfectly scorned logic and reason in every shape and always took refuge in intuitive certainty and here she was perfectly impregnable no possible amount of talent or authority or explanation could ever make her believe that any other way was better than her own or that the course she had pursued in the smallest matter could be in the least modified this had been a conceited point with her old mistress marie's mother and miss marie as dinah always called her young mistress even after her marriage found it easier to submit than contend and so dinah had ruled supreme this was the easier in that she was perfect mistress of that diplomatic art which unites the utmost subservience of manner with the utmost inflexibility as to measure dinah was mistress of the whole art and mystery of excuse-making in all its branches indeed it was an axiom with her that the cook can do no wrong and a cook in a southern kitchen finds abundance of heads and shoulders on which to lay off every sin and frailty so as to maintain her own immaculateness entire if any part of the dinner was a failure there were fifty indisputably good reasons for it and it was the fault undeniably of fifty other people whom dinah berated with unsparing zeal but it was very seldom that there was any failure in dinah's last results though her mode of doing everything was peculiarly meandering and circuitous and without any sort of calculation as to time and place though her kitchen generally looked as if it had been arranged by a hurricane blowing through it and she had about as many places for each cooking utensil as there were days in the year yet if one would have patience to wait her own good time up would come her dinner in perfect order and in a style of preparation with which an epicure could find no fault it was now the season of incipient preparation for dinner dinah who required large intervals of reflection and repose and was studious of ease in all her arrangements was seated on the kitchen floor smoking a short stumpy pipe to which she was much addicted and which she always kindled up as a sort of censor whenever she felt the need of an inspiration in her arrangements it was dinah's mode of invoking the domestic muses seated around her were various members of that rising race with which a southern household abounds engaged in shelling peas peeling potatoes picking pin feathers out of the fowls and other preparatory arrangements dinah every once in a while interrupting her meditations to give a poke or a rap on the head to some of the younger operators with the pudding stick that lay by her side in fact dinah ruled over the woolly heads of the younger members with a rod of iron and seemed to consider them born for no earthly purpose but to save her steps as she phrased it it was the spirit of the system under which she had grown up and she carried it out to its full extent miss ophelia after passing on her reformatory tour through all the other parts of the establishment now entered the kitchen dinah had heard from various sources what was going on and resolved to stand on defensive and conservative ground mentally determined to oppose and ignore every new measure 
without any actual observable contest the kitchen was a large brick-floored apartment with a great old-fashioned fireplace stretching along one side of it an arrangement which st clair had vainly tried to persuade dinah to exchange for the convenience of a modern cook-stove not she no pussyite or conservative of any school was ever more inflexibly attached to time-honoured inconveniences than dinah footnote edward bovary pussy eighteen hundred to eighteen eighty two champion of the orthodoxy of revealed religion defender of the oxford movement and regius professor of hebrew and canon of christ church oxford when st clair had first returned from the north impressed with the system and order of his uncle's kitchen arrangements he had largely provided his own with an array of cupboards drawers and various apparatus to induce systematic regulation under the sanguine illusion that it would be of any possible assistance to dinah in her arrangements he might as well have provided them for a squirrel or a magpie the more drawers and closets there were the more hiding-places could dinah make for the accommodation of old rags hair combs old shoes ribbons cast-off artificial flowers and other articles of virtu wherein her soul delighted when miss ophelia entered the kitchen dinah did not rise but smoked on in sublime tranquillity regarding her movements obliquely out of the corner of her eye but apparently intent only on the operations around her miss ophelia commenced opening a set of drawers what is this drawer for dinah she said it's handy for most anything missus said dinah so it appeared to be from the variety it contained miss ophelia pulled out first a fine damask tablecloth stained with blood having evidently been used to envelop some raw meat what's this dinah you don't wrap up meat in your mistress's best tablecloths oh lor missus no the towels was all a missin so i just did it i laid out to wash that ah eh? that's why i put it thar shiftless said miss ophelia to herself proceeding to tumble over the drawer where she found a nutmeg grater and two or three nutmegs a methodist hymn-book a couple of soiled madras handkerchiefs some yarn and knitting work a paper of tobacco and a pipe a few crackers one or two gilded china saucers with some pomade in them one or two thin old shoes a piece of flannel carefully pinned up enclosing some small white onions several damask table napkins some coarse crash towels some twine and darning needles and several broken papers from which sundry sweet herbs were sifting into the drawer where do you keep your nutmegs dinah said miss ophelia with the air of one who prayed for patience most anywhere missus there's some in that cracked teacup up there and there's some more over in that ar cupboard here are some in the grater said miss ophelia holding them up laws yes i put em there this morning i likes to keep my things handy said dinah you jake what are you stopping for you'll cotch it be still thar she added with a dive of her stick at the criminal what's this said miss ophelia holding up the saucer of pomade laws that's my hair grease i put it thar to have it handy do you use your mistress's best saucers for that law it was cause i was jiv and in sich a hurry i was gin to change it this very day here are two damask table napkins them table napkins i put thar to get em washed out some day don't you have some place here on purpose for things to be washed well master st clair got thar air chest he said for dat but i likes to mix up biscuit and hev my things on it some days and then it ain't handy a liftin up the lid why don't you mix your biscuits on the pastry table there la missus it gets sot so full of dishes and one thing and another there ain't no room no way 
but you should wash your dishes and clear them away wash my dishes said dinah in a high key as her wrath began to rise over her habitual respect of manner what does ladies know about work i want to know when'd master ever get his dinner if i was to spend all my time a washin and a puttin up dishes miss marie never telled me so no how well here are these onions laws yes said dinah thar is where i put em now i couldn't member them's particular onions i was savin for dis year very stew i'd forgot they was in dat ar old flannel Miss Ophelia lifted out the sifting papers of sweet herbs. I wish Missus wouldn't touch dem are. I likes to keep my things where I knows war to go to em, said Dinah, rather decidedly. But you don't want these holes in the papers. Them's handy for sifting aunt out, said Dinah. But you see, it spills all over the drawer. Laws, yes. If Missus will go a-tumblin things all up so, it will. Missus has spilt lots dat our way, said Dinah, coming uneasily to the drawers. If Missus only will go upstairs till my clearin' up time comes, I'll have everything right. But I can't do nothin' when ladies is round a hinderin'. You, Sam, don't you gib the baby dat our sugar bowl. I'll crack ye over if you don't mind. I'm going through the kitchen and going to put everything in order once, Dinah, and then I'll expect you to keep it so. Lor now, Miss Felia, dat ar ain't no way for ladies to do. I never did see ladies doin no sich. My old missus nor Miss Marie never did, and I don't see no kinder need on't. And Dinah stalked indignantly about while Miss Ophelia piled and sorted dishes emptied dozens of scattering bowls of sugar into one receptacle, sorted napkins, tablecloths, and towels for washing, washing, wiping, and arranging with her own hands and with a speed and a clarity which perfectly amazed Dinah. Lord, now, if dat are de way dem northern ladies do, dey ain't ladies know how, she said to some of her satellites, when at a safe hearing distance. I has things as straight as anybody, when my clearin' up time comes, but I don't want ladies round a hinderin' and gettin' my things all where I can't find em. To do Dinah justice, she had at irregular periods paroxysms of reformation and arrangement, which she called clearin' up times, when she would begin with great seal and turn every drawer and closet wrong side outward, on to the floor or tables, and make the ordinary confusion sevenfold more confounded. Then she would light her pipe and leisurely go over her arrangements, looking things over and discoursing upon them, making all the young fry scour most vigorously on the tin things, and keeping up for several hours a most energetic state of confusion, which she would explain to the satisfaction of all inquirers by the remark that she was clarin' up. She couldn't have things a gwin on so as they had been, and she was gwin to make these year young ones keep better order for dinah herself somehow indulged the illusion that she herself was the soul of order and it was only the young uns and the everybody else in the house that was the cause of anything that fell short of perfection in this respect when all the tins were scoured and the tables scrubbed snowy white and everything that could offend tucked out of sight in holes and corners dinah would dress herself up in a smart dress clean apron and high brilliant madras turban and tell all marauding young uns to keep out of the kitchen for she was gwine to have things kept nice indeed these periodic seasons were often an inconvenience to the whole household for dinah would contract such an immoderate attachment to her scoured tin as to insist upon it that it shouldn't be used again for any possible purpose at least till the ardour of the clarin up period abated miss ophelia in a few days thoroughly reformed every department of the house to a systematic pattern 
but her labours in all departments that depended on the cooperation of servants were like those of sisyphus or the danaides in despair she one day appealed to st clair there is no such thing as getting anything like a system in this family to be sure there isn't said st clair such shiftless management such waste such confusion i never saw i dare say you didn't you would not take it so coolly if you were housekeeper my dear cousin you may as well understand once for all that we masters are divided into two classes oppressors and oppressed we who are good-natured and hate severity make up our minds to a good deal of inconvenience if we will keep a shambling loose untaught set in the community for our convenience why we must take the consequence some rare cases i have seen of persons who by a peculiar tact can produce order and system without severity but i'm not one of them and so i made up my mind long ago to let things go just as they do i will not have the poor devils thrashed and cut to pieces and they know it and of course they know the staff is in their own hands but to have no time no place no order all going on in this shiftless way my dear vermont you natives up by the north pole set an extravagant value on time what on earth is the use of time to a fellow who has twice as much of it as he knows what to do with as to order and system where there is nothing to be done but to lounge on the sofa and read an hour sooner or later in breakfast or dinner isn't of much account now there's dinah gets you a capital dinner soup rag out roast fowl dessert ice creams and all and she creates it all out of chaos and old night down there in that kitchen i think it really sublime the way she manages but heaven bless us if we are to go down there and view all the smoking and squatting about and hurry scurriation of the preparatory process we should never eat more my good cousin absolve yourself from that it's more than a catholic penance and does no more good you'll only lose your own temper and utterly confound dinah let her go her own way but augustine you don't know how i found things don't i don't i know that the rolling pin is under her bed and the nutmeg grater in her pocket with her tobacco that there are sixty-five different sugar bowls one in every hole in the house that she washes dishes with a dinner napkin one day and with a fragment of an old petticoat the next but the upshot is she gets up glorious dinners makes superb coffee and you must judge her as warriors and statesmen are judged by her success but the waste the expense oh well lock everything you can and keep the key give out by driblets and never inquire for odds and ends it isn't best that troubles me augustine i can't help feeling as if these servants were not strictly honest are you sure they can be relied on augustine laughed immoderately at the grave and anxious face with which miss ophelia propounded the question oh cousin that's too good honest why of course they aren't what upon earth is to make them so why don't you instruct instruct oh fiddlestick what instructing do you think i should do i look like it as to marie she has spirit enough to be sure to kill off a whole plantation if i'd let her manage but she won't get the cheatery out of them are there no honest ones well now and then one whom nature makes so impracticably simple truthful and faithful that the worst possible influence can't destroy it but you see from the mother's breast the colored child feels and sees that there are none but underhand ways open to it 
it can get along no other way with its parents its mistress its young master and missy playfellows cunning and deception become necessary inevitable habits it isn't fair to expect anything else of him he ought not to be punished for it as to honesty the slave is kept in that dependent semi-childish state that there is no making him realize the rights of property or feel that his master's goods are not his own if he can get them for my part i don't see how they can be honest such a fellow as tom here is is a moral miracle and what becomes of their souls said miss ophelia that isn't my affair as i know of said st clair i am only dealing in facts of the present life the fact is that the whole race are pretty generally understood to be turned over to the devil for our benefit in this world however it may turn out in another this is perfectly horrible said miss ophelia you ought to be ashamed of yourselves i don't know as i am we are in pretty good company for all that said st clair as people in the broad road generally are look at the high and the low all the world over and it's the same story the lower class used up body soul and spirit for the good of the upper it is so in england it is so everywhere and yet all christendom stands aghast with virtuous indignation because we do the thing in a little different shape from what they do it it isn't so in vermont ah well in new england and in the free states you have the better of us i grant but there's the bell so cousin let us for a while lay aside our sectional prejudices and come out to dinner as miss ophelia was in the kitchen in the latter part of the afternoon some of the sable children called out law sakes thar's prue a-coming grunting along like she allers does a tall bony coloured woman now entered the kitchen bearing on her head a basket of rusks and hot rolls ho prue you've come said dinah prue had a peculiar scowling expression of countenance and a sullen grumbling voice she set down her basket squatted herself down and resting her elbows on her knees said oh lor i wished i's dead why do you wish you were dead said miss ophelia i'd be out of my misery said the woman gruffly without taking her eyes from the floor what need you getting drunk then and cutting up prue said a spruce quadroon chambermaid dangling as she spoke a pair of coral eardrops the woman looked at her with a sour surly glance maybe you'll come to it one of these year days i'd be glad to see you i would and then you'd be glad of a drop like me to forget your misery come prue said dinah let's look at your rusks here's missus will pay for them miss ophelia took out a couple of dozen there's some tickets in that are old crack jug on the top shelf said dinah you jake climb up and get it down tickets what are they for said miss ophelia we buy tickets of her masser and she gives us bread for em and they count my money and tickets when i get home to see if i's got the change and if i had they half kills me and serves you right said jane the pert chambermaid if you will take their money to get drunk on that's what she does missus and that's what i will do i can't live no other way drink and forget my misery you are very wicked and very foolish said miss ophelia to steal your master's money to make yourself a brute with it's mighty likely missus but i will do it yes i will o oh, lord i wish i stead i do i wish i stead and out of my misery and slowly and stiffly the old creature rose and got her basket on her head again but before she went out she looked at the quadroon girt who still stood playing with her eardrops you think you're mighty fine with them are a frolicking and tossing your head 
and a-looking down on everybody well never mind you may live to be a poor old cut-up critter like me hope to the lord ye will i do then see if you won't drink 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 yourself into torment and sarve ye right to ugh and with a malignant howl the woman left the room disgusting old beast said adolph who was getting his master shaving water if i were her master i'd cut her up worse than she is ye couldn't do that are no ways said dinah her back's a far sight now she can't never get a dress together over it i think such low creatures ought not to be allowed to go round to genteel families said miss jane what do you think mr st clair she said coquettishly tossing her head at adolph it must be observed that among other appropriations from his master's stock adolph was in the habit of adopting his name and address and that the style under which he moved among the coloured circles of new orleans was that of mr st clair i'm certainly of your opinion miss benoir said adolph benoir was the name of marie st clair's family and jane was one of her servants pray miss benoir may i be allowed to ask if those drops are for the ball to-morrow night they are certainly bewitching i wonder now mr st clair what the impudence of you men will come to said jane tossing her pretty head till the eardrops twinkled again i shan't dance with you for a whole evening if you go to asking me any more questions oh you couldn't be so cruel now i was just dying to know whether you would appear in your pink tarlatane said adolph what is it said rosa a bright piquant little cadroon who came skipping downstairs at this moment why mr st clair's so impudent on my honour said adolph i'll leave it to miss rosa now i know he's always a saucy creature said rosa poising herself on one of her little feet and looking maliciously at adolph he's always getting me so angry with him oh ladies ladies you will certainly break my heart between you said adolph i shall be found dead in my bed some morning and you'll have it to answer for do hear the horrid creature talk said both ladies laughing immoderately come clear out you i can't have you cluttering up the kitchen said dinah in my way foolin round here aunt dinah's glum cause she can't go to the ball said rosa don't want none of your light-coloured balls said dinah cuttin round makin believe you's white folks arter all you's niggers much as i am aunt dinah greases her wool stiff every day to make it lie straight said jane and it will be wool after all said rosa maliciously shaking down her long silky curls well in the lord's sight aunt wool as good as hair any time said dinah i'd like to have missus say which is worth the most a couple such as you or one like me get out wid ye ye trumpery i won't have ye round here the conversation was interrupted in a twofold manner st clair's voice was heard at the head of the stairs asking adolph if he meant to stay all night with his shaving water and miss ophelia coming out of the dining-room said jane and rosa what are you wasting your time for here go in and attend to your muslins our friend tom who had been in the kitchen during the conversation with the old rusk woman had followed her out into the street he saw her go on giving every once in a while a suppressed groan at last she set her basket down on a doorstep and began arranging the old faded shawl which covered her shoulders i'll carry your basket apiece said tom compassionately why should ye said the woman i don't want no help you seem to be sick or in trouble or something said tom i ain't sick said the woman shortly i wish said tom looking at her earnestly 
I wish I could persuade you to leave off drinking. Don't you know it will be the ruin of ye, body and soul? I knows I'm gwine to torment, said the woman sullenly. You don't need to tell me that, are eyes ugly, eyes wicked. Eyes gwine straight to torment, oh, Lord, I wish eyes thar. Tom shuddered at these frightful words, spoken with a sullen, impassioned earnestness. Oh, Lord, have mercy on ye, poor critter. Han't ye never heard of Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ? Who's he? Why, he's the Lord, said Tom. I think I've heard tell of the Lord, and the judgment and torment, I've heard of that. But didn't anybody ever tell you of the Lord Jesus, that loved us poor sinners and died for us? Don't know nothing about that, said the woman. Nobody hadn't never loved me since my old man died. Where was you raised? said Tom. Up in Kentuck. A man kept me to breed chillin' for market, and sold em as fast as they got big enough. Last of all he sold me to a speculator, and my master got me a him. What set you into this bad way of drinkin? To get shed of my misery. I had one child after I come here, and I thought then I'd have one to raise, cause master wasn't a speculator. It was de peartest little thing, and missus she seemed to think a heap on't at first. It never cried. It was lightly and fat, but missus tucked sick, and I tended her, and I tucked the fever, and my milk all left me, and the child it pined to skin and bone, and missus wouldn't buy milk for it. She wouldn't hear to me when I told her I hadn't milk. She said she knowed I could feed it on what other folks eat. And the child kinder pined and cried and cried and cried and cried day and night and got all gone to skin and bones. And Mrs. Got sought again, and she said to want nothing but crossness. She wished it were dead, she said, and she wouldn't let me have it at nights. Cause she said it kept me awake and made me good for nothing. She made me sleep in her room, and I had to put it away off in some kind of garret. And thar it cried itself to death one night. It did, and I tucked to drinkin' to keep its cryin' out of my ears. I did, and I will drink. I will if I do go to torment for it. Master says I shall go to torment, and I tell him I've got thar now. Oh, ye poor critter," said Tom. "Han't nobody never told you how the Lord Jesus loved ye and died for ye? Han't they told ye that He'll help ye, and ye can go to heaven and have rest at last?" "I looks like gwine to heaven," said the woman. "Ant thar where white folks is gwine? Suppose they'd have me thar. I'd rather go to torment and get away from Master and Missus. I had so," she said. As with her usual groan, she got her basket on her head and walked sullenly away. Tom turned and walked sorrowfully back to the house. In the court he met little Eva, a crown of tuberoses on her head and her eyes radiant with delight. Oh, Tom, here you are. I'm glad I found you. Papa says you may get out the ponies. And take me in my little new carriage, she said, catching his hand. But what's the matter, Tom? You look sober. I feel bad, Miss Eva, said Tom sorrowfully, but I'll get the horses for you. But do tell me, Tom, what is the matter? I saw you talking to cross old Prue. Tom, in simple, earnest phrase, told Eva the woman's history. She did not exclaim or wonder or weep, as other children do. Her cheeks grew pale and a deep earnest shadow passed over her eyes. She laid both hands on her bosom and sighed heavily. End of chapter 18